Hello and welcome back to another episode of uh, Octo Reacts or Octo What's Sold Now. I'm not too really sure what we're going to call this one, actually. Um, I didn't do a live on Friday night. I went away for the weekend. Uh, stay right to the end if you can. Um, I've got some footage of something you may find a little bit cute if you're that way inclined. Uh, so we're going to actually do a bit of a What's Sold video today. On a Friday night, we normally do a live. I'll go through the, the Flipwise data, what I've sold that week. Um, and obviously give a bit of an indication of what's going on. So I want to touch base uh, today because obviously I've got nothing better. Than... <laughs> I've prepared myself, just got back. A little bit sunburned, if you haven't already told. Um, so basically, I'm going to go through the data today, just the eight best things or the eight most unique things that I sold in the last week, um, what the story is, a little bit about how I sourced them, what to keep an eye out for, and a little bit for those people that are probably new to the space, um, a bit of realism, actually, how long these actually things take to sell. Um, we will get into that a little bit later. So please, by all means, when you are watching YouTube content, when you are asking questions in Facebook groups and Reddit and all these different things, uh, you do your own research. Because what I'm finding is a lot of people uh, are just really ingesting the, the, the information that I give you and all the other YouTubers give you. Well, 99.9% of us, <laughs> we, we, we do mean to give you the right stuff. So basically, we are trying to assist you. However, sometimes we actually forget that there are people new to the space that don't understand um, sell-through rates and all these different things. So I'm not going to patronize you. I'm just going to go through the data, uh, give you an idea of uh, why it took that long to sell or why how why it sold that quickly. I'll, I'll get out of my words in a minute. But before so before we get into that, the octopus has just asked me if you can actually slide across. He's added some um, some songs to a playlist called "The Tentacles of Ambition: uh, Songs for World Domination." So basically, the octopus is making some songs for his viewers. So if you're a reseller, if you need some motivation, or if you're that way inclined, you just want to listen to the octopus take over the world. So he's using AI to reprogram some. Some well-known songs. Um, so if you can work out what they are, put in the comment section below on the respective songs. Um, like I said, he, he <laughs> he's, he's quite proud of these songs. So what he does, he actually gets the AI to recreate the lyrics. Then he punches it into another program that actually spits out the lyrics. Uh, I can't sing. So K-Fan, if you are watching, <laughs> he did pass on the comment. And please, 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 you do not want me singing, uh, screeching along. So add that to your collection uh, or your playlist. So these songs are generated. They're a little bit rocky. They're a little bit metal. Um, however, he's open to su suggestions. If you do want some type of style or genre of music or if you'd like a song, uh, put it in there. He'll rework it and go from that perspective because the purpose of this playlist is obviously to feed his ego. However, also to get you into that momentum of listing or if you want to go running, all these different things. Actually, really, they're, they're motivational pieces from a sense that, yeah, they're, they're quite parody. So that, yeah, they're a bit of a laugh. They're not serious in any capacity. But please, yeah, if you haven't already subscribed, jump on there, add it to your list. He's going to add a new song every Saturday. So, uh, he is toying around with a couple of songs coming out this week. Uh, however, you'll just have to keep an eye out on Instagram just to see what he does. So what we'll do now is we'll jump into Flipwise. I'll jump across. So this is the Flipwise data. So uh, I use this program primarily to keep a track of all my incomings, outgoings. Uh, when I list the products, uh, all the data on those products that I, I source locally and sell locally and sell on eBay and all these different things, right? So I'm no way sponsored or endorsed by Flipwise. Um, I do enjoy Flipwise. However, I'm not endorsing it um, because there is missing a piece of information that I've spoken to the creator about previously. Um, he will look at that later on. So once that gets implemented, um, from an Australian perspective, I will endorse this project, product. Um, so I'm quite happy from that perspective. So what I'll look up here, what we're looking here on, as we do on a Friday night, uh, we look at the data from what this week is compared to last week. So the data that we see here is after the cost of goods, after eBay fees, after pretty much everything's been taken out of that. Um, so that's a net profit margin. However, I haven't taken out tax and I haven't taken out GST. If for those people overseas, GST is kind of like our VAT tax or also like our sales tax for a, a state thing. But opposed to being state specific, I'll spit it out. Uh, it's more of a countrywide program, more tax. <laughs> so over the last two weeks, I have been slack. I've only listed two new items. That's not to say that I've only listed two items. Um, I do have a lot of variation listings. If you do watch me previously, um, I use variation listings quite heavily. I get a lot of stock in that feed into those variation listings. However, when I top those variation listings up, 
they don't include or they don't get counted um, into the data that basically comes into that collection. So, so what I normally do for variation listings, and Justin, by all means, if you are watching, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but what I normally do is I normally go to the ledger. I actually put the variation listings in that perspective because I normally source um, a collection, maybe for $1,000 or $100 or $50, depending on where it is. Um, and from my findings, there's no actual way of breaking that bulk lot into individual items. What happens is if I am using a variation listing, for example, every time I add variation listings to that, it actually prices it per unit and I have to keep playing around with the figures. And if I put it in the ledger and becomes an expense, then I assign that product a cost of zero, um, but it comes off the figures as far as I'm aware and far as I can track it. <laughs> so hopefully I'm doing it right, uh, but I haven't come across any trip ups or any slip ups from this perspective. So I'll jump back to the normal screen because I'm flicking between screens. So in the last week, I've sold 45 items. So that 45 items is also a variation listing. So if someone pays, um, you know, purchases a variation listing and they choose six or seven products in that variation listings, that goes to six or seven products. That doesn't actually class as one. So keep that in mind. So it goes on to the left, more recently listed. Um, I listed a, a little Groudon figure. I don't have a copy of him here. He's on the other desk. However, he, he's about the size of Pumpkin Bill. Hopefully you can see that. <laughs> I um, really need to work these screens out. Uh, also sourced Pokemon Sword for the Switch um, and also some different things that I sourced in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so what we do here is basically these are all the what's sold and this is some of the products we will be looking at um, through this video. So what I will do now is I'll slick across this screen. So this gives me some data. Um, it gives me gross sales over the last seven days and because we're, we're filming on a Sunday, um, I'll, I'll try and get it to this because it encapsulates it from you know, this Sunday to last Sunday kind of thing. So it's probably the cleanest so I can get it from this perspective. So in the last week, I've almost sold $2,100 worth of gross sales, which basically means what the person has actually paid for. Um, so that includes postage, that includes the cost of, the cost of the goods, uh, that includes eBay fees, that includes everything, right? So um, basically out of that, my net profit is $1,043. So that's taking, the program's taking off uh, the cost of goods, eBay fees, promoted listings, everything you can think of that's attributed to that, that expense. So what I normally do is I put the postage supplies and the office supplies in the ledger, and that also comes off towards the end. So I'm not too, not too concerned about that. So that's really a splitting hairs, but you can take it on good authority. It's about just under... $1,050 for the last week. Uh, my average sale price was $43.46 and my average average <laughs> profit per sale was $21.72. Uh, so the, my profit margin was around about 50%, my not profit margin, and my average was 50% here. So if we go a little bit further down, uh, we can actually see where I'm sourcing items from. So my primary, primary uh, biggest sourcing uh, is Facebook Marketplace. Uh, Salvos, Funko, USA. So that's obviously items that I bring in. Uh, the Church Shop Shop, which I've said numerous times on the lives that I source at. Vinnie's, don't particularly like. However, <laughs> if they're selling stuff that you know, meets my metrics, I'm more than happy to throw it in the cart. Uh, Amazon, which is a little bit of eBay, or sorry, retail arbitrage, and all of it at Target as well. So that's a bit of retail arbitrage. So in the last week, I've spent $25 on new inventory, <laughs> which is not phenomenal amounts. Uh, the cost of goods sold for the last uh, seven days has been $385. Uh, marketplace fees, which is primarily just eBay, is $343. That includes the the final value fee, the, the 30 cents extra fee, and also the promoted listings. And my shipping expenses have been $315. So theoretically, if you add all those up, that should come up to that $1,043. Pretty much smack bag, 50%. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about to... For those new to um, to reselling or those just getting back into it and all these different things, so this program will also tell me what um, my average time is to list. Uh, it's a bit skewed at the moment because what will when you actually enter the data in, it'll actually ask you when you buy it. I click on the day what I do, and how I get around that is actually if I am uh, running behind. For example, I bought some things when I was down the coast. I put a little sticky note with the date I bought it, stick it on, um, that I can always reuse that sticky note later on. I'll just cut across through it and all these different things. So that gives me an indication where I've actually purchased that item and how much I've purchased it for. Uh, but this is what I want to drag attention to. So basically, 
uh, for those that are new in the retailing, retailing space. I see a lot of people on YouTube, a lot of content creators basically talking about, um, you know, if you are financially struggling, use reselling as a, as a platform to, you know, get some extra income and all these different things. But what I want to bring attention to is that my average time to sell is five months. Um, and we'll, when we go into those eight listings that I have chosen for today, we will see why some products can take two or three days up to a week to sell. Um, and on the flip side, 12 months plus. So it really comes down to sourcing and what you're actually sourcing. Um, learning what your products are, learning sell-through rate. A lot of things, and I have said previously, I don't like selling clothes and a lot of things that took a long time to close. <laughs> so take that into consideration when you are looking at niches, when you are looking at different things. And if you are really struggling for cash, um, primarily from my perspective, I pay up for items, um, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, explains why my cost of goods is very high. And on the flip side is why my profit margin is high. I'm not relying on one, $2 off shop purchases. Um, I'm buying very um, niche products. You can also go through my sold listings on eBay if you're that way inclined. My, my eBay store is in the, <laughs> in the description below. So have a, have a bit of a squeeze what I'm selling, get an indication from that perspective. Um, but like I said, they're the ones I sell. So if you are new to the reselling space, I wouldn't recommend you going to buy the things that I buy, primarily because of the, the expense outlay and all these different things. Um, however, I would suggest this, that once you get a little bit of financial backing, um, you know, don't you know, delve into you know, debt and all those different things. But when you do get a little bit of cash behind you from your business, uh, start looking into those you know, higher priced, higher return items. Only my perspective. Yeah, so I'm not gonna, not gonna tell you to go down that path, but that's pretty much how I've done it. Um, and I've been reselling for you know, 20 years or whatever you wanna look at it from that perspective. Um, changes every time I, I jump on a video. <laughs> Started in 2006. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into another screen. So this is the first uh, item that I've chosen to to show today because I'm just basically choosing the uh, the top ten, sorry, top eight items being the octopus. Uh, so this is a Jackie Chan Kung Fu for the Nez. Uh, the cost of good was five dollars. I sold it for ninety nine dollars plus uh, twenty eight twenty five shipping, which is all there on the on the data. You can actually see it there. I'll jump back to the screen so I can highlight it for you. So Flipwise will actually give me the data. So I sold it on the 29th of September, which was uh, today, surprisingly enough. If, it took me five months to sell. So this is pretty much smack bang on the average. So I don't think I've got a photo of it anymore. However, um, if you go through my Instagram, I'm pretty sure there's a photo on Instagram. But probably about you know five or six months ago, I actually picked up this massive Nintendo lot. So Nes lot. Um, it was $120 and it came to... Um, just shy of four dollars eighty six a piece. Uh, there was a whole bunch of games. There was consoles. There was guns. There was controllers. Everything looked like it was brand new. The console didn't look like it had been touched in 30, 40 years. There was no sun damage. It was phenomenal condition. A lot of the games had their boxes. Very few had their manuals. Um, so Jackie Chan Kung Fu. I did recently drop the price on this. Um, I did have it for $150, then I dropped it to $99, just by virtue of how long it's been sitting in the store. Uh, and this particular item that I sourced, you know, obviously that Nintendo bundle, I think I'm down to about two or three more games left. Um, so it's well and, well, well and truly paid for itself. I think it's about the four grand. So look for those kind of items, right? So what it, um, you won't come across these very often, but by all means, Look for your vintage video games. So your, your Nintendo, your Super Nintendo. If you do come across uh, Sega Master System games and you are in the PAL ter territories, please reach out to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the process of trying to rebuild my childhood collection. Um, I'm, I'm still down a few games, so I may actually buy them off you if you're that way inclined. So we'll get along to the next one now. So this is basically a fig pin. Um, XL. So what it is, is basically similar to a collectible item like a, I won't say a Funko Pop, but it's it's just basically a pin, which I don't have any on me at the moment. So these were a, um, some kind of con, uh, which is basically a conference or yeah, like Comic Con kind of thing. These are an exclusive to that. And the way, the reason why these were so uh, special, sorry, I'll lose my voice again, is basically these are the glitter ones. So they got their, you know, Vegito, I think it is, or Cook. <laughs> oh, I love Dragon Ball Super, but I can't work out who the, the character on the left, left is. But basically, uh, his blue hair has got glitter, and I think Broly on the right has got a gold outline. That's what makes them um, 
sought after. They're a two pack. I actually imported these from the States. So this is something that I imported uh, close to 10 months ago, probably even a little bit longer ago, because um, I normally sit my stuff in Florida, which is my collection point uh, for about two months, because that's how much free um, time I get for that particular service. After the two months, I push everything across. So I normally get a fair bit of chunk in when I when I import stuff through. So there's a good point, good chance I actually forked out for this item two months, uh, sorry, 12 months ago. Um, so what it comes down to is that I paid, I think it was just shy of, and I will jump back into the data. This is give me a bit of an idea. So I paid um, $19 per unit for these. Um, and what happened is I actually bought 17. So I've only actually sold one, <laughs> but uh, there are very sell, slow sell through rates. I would strongly suggest um, probably not picking these up. So these retailed for about $75 American. And the place that I got them from actually had a, um, a pricing discrepancy or a pricing error or something along with that. So I scooped in, grabbed the pretty much 18 of them, 20 of them, I can't remember now uh, from that perspective. So fig pin is um, like I've gone before, is like a collector piece kind of thing from that perspective. And the individual locks, they've got different um, little things. And yeah, they've got a collection and a community that sorts them, so, you know, collects them from that perspective. So what I've told you before is make sure you go into like collector areas such as, you know, Facebook groups, uh, Reddit posts, Reddit groups, all these different things that exclusively deal with these kind of things, you know, like your Funko with your fig pins and all those different things. Get in there with the collectors, find out what the collectors are looking for, what they want, and see if you can source it from that perspective. That's probably the best bit of information I can give you. I'm going to jump across to this one. So this was a vintage book that I found from the church shop shop. Don't worry about the custom SKU. I used a cell similar off Another one uh, was actually a dollar from my local church op shop, which I absolutely love. It's opened up once a month. Uh, not opened up October for some reason, <laughs> which they told me eight times when I was there last time. So picked it up for a dollar. It did sit for a very long time. So it sold for about 10 months. Um, however, for a dollar, I wasn't too concerned. And it sold for $35. So this one dates back from to the 70s, I think it was. So it was a fairly um, old product. Um, I didn't actually write it in there as well. So it probably would have sent, sold a little bit quicker if I actually had to use the, like a keyword called, you know, book or something along the lines of this. Um, these are the kind of products that I don't really sell. So I don't really know the keywords. I should be better. Um, I have had conversations with Blake, uh, Blake Gorfine on the podcast before his book. I couldn't sell a pair of Nike shoes. Um, and I asked Blake and as soon as Blake seen, he said, you don't have shoes in the title. <laughs> so if you are having items that are seen around for a very, very, very long time, um, and you are looking at doing that sell similar or that nuclear reset, whatever you want to call it, go through your listings and actually make sure the titles are correct. So yeah, that's something that like I would have brought up, you know, American Colorfax, um, I would probably got rid of Neil and obviously Rob Shaw, put book in there, uh, game tips and all those different things. So you use a little bit more, a bit of a, a structure from that perspective. So what we will do now, we'll jump onto this one. Also bought this from the church op shop. It cost me a dollar. Uh, it's been sitting around for another 10 months. Surprise, surprise. 10 months is coming up quite often. So this is a... Um, a hoodie or a jumper or whatever you want to call it. It's Coca-Cola. It was really nice condition. It was almost like what it looked like it was brand new. Uh, what killed this was actually it was immense small. Um, so you need to be very mindful of when you are sourcing clothes, probably stay away from those small and mediums. You want to probably large, extra large 2XL. I do find the bigger guys stuff like the 3, 4, 5 XL do really well in, in, in clothes like Dixon um, and probably jeans if you, <laughs> I haven't sold jeans for a long time. So, um, but definitely Dixon, if you are sourcing Dixon flannels, your 2, 3, 4 X does pretty well in that perspective as well. So the purchase price was actually a dollar, not um, $3. So the, basically I sold this product for $24.99 plus $10.99 shipping. Um, then it came out to be about just shy of $20 return. But 10 months, if I had to pick this product, yes, it was a dollar. Um, however, I could have used that dollar on something else and conflicted all these different things. But what it really came for this campaign uh, for this particular item is because once it folded up, it was quite chunky. So uh, it was more of a space issue opposed to actually the cost issue for this one. And so we'll slide on to another one. So this is uh, the next one I wanted to show you guys is I purchased this about just shy about 10 days ago. I was going to say two weeks ago. So this is um, the Shodo Dragon Ball Z um, Goku action figure. So basically, these are little um, three and a half inch 
uh, action figures. I picked up a bulk lot of these. I think I paid, I think I got just shy of 20. Um, I normally write on the bottom down here where it says notes, uh, the products I bought, but each of them came out to be $8.33. I paid 150, 170. I can't remember what it was uh, off my head. Um, you can work out the calculations from that perspective, but they are quite a decent sell through on these particular products. So um, I did pick up some of the rare ones. Someone, how these came around was that I think someone moved out and left a lot of their stuff with their flatmates and their flatmates just basically put it all in Facebook marketplace for, for cheapest chips or <laughs> for a blowout price. Um, these particular items, I've got a majority of the list them for, for seventy four ninety nine. However, I've got a couple of outlying characters, which are quite rare and, and quite sought after probably around the $125 mark. So for the 150, $170 investment, I'm probably looking at bringing it back about two grand before fees and tax and all those different things. So this one lasted nine days. Um, I've worked out, I probably just need to sell three of the 17 or 20, however many it was. Um, then I've got my money back and everything else is pure profit from that perspective. But I will jump back in there. So like I said, it was 8.33, the custom there, that's correct for once. The spelling costs were 36.43. Then why they're so high for is I don't, promote these these probably only promoted at two to three percent however um when you sell things on ebay and a lot of people know already is that when you sell you have to pay fees on your your products your promoted listings you pay on the um postage and also sales tax so this one went to america um and that's why it had that little bit higher so the total cost was 44.76 the net return was 50 almost 52 dollars and the return on investment was 624 percent um but this is also the breakdown here. It actually gives you a bit of a breakdown of all those different things. The cost um, of seventeen zero four because these things are very light, and this is what it cost us seventeen dollars and four cents to ship up to two hundred and fifty grams to the states. Well, that's under my uh, Australia Post band. So what it does is basically gives me a bit of a cheaper rate. I think it's about twenty three, twenty four dollars for memory, um, <clears throat> which for those people in the states probably works out to be about. 11 or 12 dollars us uh probably 11 dollars us to ship this item to you um, and like i said these are the kind of things these were immaculate they're pristine condition so i i would expect over the next especially moving into q4 we will be selling a, a quite a lot of these coming forward uh we'll slide across to the next one <laughs> this is the bane of my existence so i actually picked this up um on the 21st of september so about a week ago uh, I listed it. It was a bit of a gamble from this perspective. It was a 1999, uh, sorry, 1991 Apple Macintosh Classic. There we go. If I had to read that at the top. So basically, um, I bought it. I was told on Facebook Marketplace that it works. Went around, picked it up. He didn't have a power cord. We always take a power cord with you. <laughs> we'll just don't take a chance if it doesn't have a power cord. The reason why I picked this up for is because the price I paid, which was $75, um, if it was working, it was probably around that six, seven hundred dollars. Um, if it was parts only, probably around that two fifty. Um, from that perspective, I can see my reflection in that. <laughs> so probably take it from an angle in the future. Uh, the unit itself was in pretty decentish condition. There was a little bit of rusting on the back um, portal. Uh, on the back ports, I had to get a toothbrush and clean it up as much as I can. From that perspective, there was something rattling around in there, so I did boot it up. It did burn. It did boot. Um, excuse me. It did turn on. You can hear it. You know, you know, kind of from that perspective, and trying to boot up and all these different things. But um, it was something loose in there. I wasn't too sure what it was. I didn't have the the proper equipments to <laughs> to undo it and go in from that perspective and have a look. So I took some really good photos of it. Out, um, it was a very nice display piece, right? So if you had an Apple collector and all these different things, and this is part of the reason why I picked it up, you know, kind of not really caring if it was working. If it was working, fantastic. If it wasn't working, yeah, you know, no skin off my nose per se. So we'll jump back in the screen. Um, I did, yeah, you know, list it for, um, so, uh, sorry, I did pay $75 for it. It took two days to sell. Um, and I did articulate quite clearly throughout the listing. And then the person actually bought it. We spoke on message a few, a few times just to basically say, hey, look, this is what's going on. He wanted me to open it up. I said, look, hey, I don't have the appropriate tools. With these items, I actually sell them for parts and parts only or not working. I can't remember the particular item specific is uh, for the condition. But what I normally do is I accept 30-day returns uh, at my expense across my listings with the exception of the parts are not working. So basically... And this is what was communicated to the buyer. Um, so it was articulated quite clearly. So if it comes to an INAD, um, so basically I can say, hey, well, look, this was taken into consideration. These are all the things I, and I have said numerous times before, is actually 
downgrade the condition of these things. So when people actually receive it, they think it's fantastic. They're actually happy from that perspective. So the selling cost was 64.74, which is expense. <laughs> um, total cost was $140. So that, that selling cost and the total cost is basically a combination of the, the purchase price and the selling cost. And the selling cost also encompasses the postage and the postage on this was expensive. So the net return was just shy of my um, investment price as you know, $75. So I made $72 profit on it after being all said and done. So the postage came to $39.40 and glad it came, went to a major city <laughs> because it needed to be from that perspective. Um, it was quite a big box and quite heavy. Uh, would I go out and actively source these kind of things again? No, um, primarily, I made just my money back, $75. Uh, I'm just glad it was a quick sell-through rate from that perspective. I was <laughs> biting uh, when it didn't turn on because I was thinking I'm going to be stuck with this thing for at least three, four, five months until the right buyer comes along. I'm probably going to break even. Um, I was lucky enough for this product to move quite quickly. So I would not suggest that you go actually go looking for this item. Uh, the next one I want to bring up is a bunch of the Goosebumps books. Basically, I paid a dollar for each of these. I think there's a lot of six. Um, they're all pretty much first edition or second edition um, from the 90s. I sold them as a bulk lot. So basically, and I, th I said before in a previous video, is that I bought a whole bunch of Goosebumps books and Fear Street books and all these different things from the local op shop for a dollar each. Um, I picked out the good ones, so the later ones, which was Werewolf Skin, uh, which had the mask still in it, and also Haunted High School or something. I can't remember which one it was. So those two, well, the Haunted High School sold for $40, which well and truly paid for my outlay for all the books I bought that day. I still got the Werewolf Skin um, in the garage. That should go around Halloween or there, thereabouts. So um, probably from, I think it was an investment of 15 or $20, but I paid all up, probably should bring that to 20 to 30 back, uh, all said and done. So I'll jump back to this one. Uh, that cost me $6. I bought it from Salvos. Listed, took two weeks to sell. Uh, selling cost was $15.24. Total cost was $21.24, which is like I said, it comes into that $15.24 plus all those different things. Uh, the net return was $13, which I think... Like I said, I paid $20 for the whole bundle. Um, <clears throat> so the final value fee was $4.11. The ad fee was $1.93. So I don't really promote books very high. I think it's about 2 or 3 4 5%. You know, if you <laughs> if you're that way inclined, you can go and have a check out. You can work it out from that perspective. Um, my net profit margin was 39%. Um, I do list a couple of my categories at very exorbitant high rates uh, from a promotion perspective. You know, one particular category, if you have been watching me for a, a quite a long time, you probably know which what I'm talking about. I promote at 15%. That's primarily just because I can be the top of the thing. Um, and that works out really well for me from that perspective. Uh, books, I used to have at 15%. However, I don't particularly like sourcing books or I don't really enjoy listing books. Um, everyone knows my <laughs> my thoughts on books. Um, but what I normally do is I've dropped it down to about 5%. Um, so that from that perspective as well is that books does do have some money in it, right? I'm not going to dispute that. You know, obviously people can show me otherwise. However, the amount of books that you need to find in an op shop, you know, my particular items, and you can see um, from the items that I sourced earlier on, <clears throat> you know, they're very specialized, very niche kind of things. Um, I get in, get out kind of thing with books. I, you know, I was just lucky enough to stumble across a shelf that was full of Goosebumps and Fear Street books like this, um, where if I go into a, 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 an op shop or a, a thrift store or anywhere else like that, um, yeah, there's shelves and shelves and shelves of books and maybe 1% of those books are actually worth my time or worth listing from that perspective. <sighs> Variation listings as well. Um, I was going to show you a, a variation listing, but it's a bit a little bit complicated. <laughs> but if you do want to know um, how I do my variation listings, please click on the description list below. Um, that little line you should see struck under the video will actually show you how to do my variation listings. If you want me to show you a step-by-step -step one, um, I know Grumpy Granny has a variation listing video. However, I will also create one to step you through it. However, variation listings, especially if you have you know, stuff like goosebumps or stuff that you can replenish quite uh, easily, like you know, I kind of keep thinking of Charlene Harris, which is a Sookie Stackhouse books. Um, I see them everywhere, or Kathy Rakes, and all these different books from that perspective. If you get them cheap enough, I'm like talking about fifty cents to a dollar. I don't know what they go for, so don't <laughs> don't quote me on those different things. But it, it, to me, variation listings are almost when you hear people say, "If, if in doubt, part it out." Um, 
that's how you should from my perspective treat variation listings especially book series and all those different things because a reader mightn't want to commit to if they have if they've only you know stumbled across goosebumps before they may only want to commit to one or two books in that series to see what it's like and obviously go from that perspective they mightn't want to buy a bundle of six books or 10 books or 15 books um on the on the proviso that they might like it or they might already have two or three books and those different things with a variation listing they can drop down click at the ones that they want add them to cart and go from that perspective so like i said if you are a bookseller if you are selling things that have a variation i'm sorry if you are replenishable in some sort um consider variation listings they, they do really well for me uh, we're getting to the end don't worry <laughs> so we're actually looking now at a a coffee cup um, that I bought. I did a TikTok on this uh, probably about, I'll tell you in a minute, uh, seven months ago. There you go. So basically, um, I was dropping my daughter off at her work. So I went to the op shop on the way back and picked up a couple of, I think it was three um, Starbucks mugs for $5 each. <clears throat> this one sold yesterday or today. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I basically sold it for there you go 55 dollars because i think they sent me an offer through because i had it listed for 59 i'll tell you in a second sorry i had it listed for 64.99 they sent me an offer for 55 dollars after seven months i'm well and truly ready to get it out the door so on that 65.90 which includes 10 dollars 90 shipping um was 33 cents final value fee um which is a fixed one the final fee was seven dollars 76 the ad fee was four dollars 73 which is probably uh it probably was marketed under collectibles, which was probably around about the 10% mark. Uh, cost of ship was $12.11. For those in Australia, I sent it by a medium box, um, put a lot of packaging material in it from that perspective. This gives it a little bit of buffer either side. Um, for those in America, it's probably in a kilo, so maybe just over half a pound. Uh, my return on this was 36 35 Return on investment, 727% if you're that way inclined. Um, but like I said, the big thing, it took seven months to sell. So it's a very, very, very long sell-through rate. I've said numerous times on the podcast that I do with Grumpy Grady, I want to sell things within two weeks. If I buy it on a Monday, for example, I want it gone by Friday. Um, <laughs> Idealistic. Like, so that's what I would like to source in particular in the future. So you do find a lot of people on TikTok. You do find a lot of people in YouTube shorts, especially Gary V and all these different things talking about coffee cups and how coffee cups are fantastic and how much money you can make from coffee cups. Yes, you can make a lot of money from coffee cups. However, you're going to be waiting seven months to get that money back. So if you are struggling for cash or if you are struggling, you know, and you want to go into reselling from that perspective and you're going to buy a whole bunch of coffee cups because Gary V told you that you're going to be the next millionaire of coffee cups do be mindful of um this one the reason why i picked it up for is because it's starbucks um it's a city series um it's a particular city series uh and it is flawless uh, unlike a foot rot flats uh <laughs> cup or mug that i took shreds off last week so like i said you really need to make sure there's no chips and that includes on the bottom of the mug um I don't have anything here, but I've got an open can of Coke and I'm not going to tip that upside down. But on the bottom of the mug, there's that little bit of uh, ceramic on there. Make sure there's no chips in there as well. So that's what you can take into consideration. So for the last one, before we slide in to wrap it up for the day, um, I just want to show you what I picked this up last weekend. I went thrifting with my cousin. Um, found this in Vinny's. Really cool, actually. Um, so basically, this is a probably the, the very first iteration of the creepy critters or the bug. I think in Australia it's called bug. It's like a little board game. You flick a, a um, little wheel around and it basically gives you a body part. This is probably jumping on the back of the, <laughs> the 1970s you know, horror movies and all from that perspective. So I picked this up from Vinnie's for $5 and that was that, that cost of goods that you've seen a little bit earlier. This is probably the only product that I got from Vinnie's in the last week, actually. Um, however... <clears throat> It did have on the box, you know, sold as is. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with that because I'm thinking if you're a thrift store and you are asking $5 for a board game, yes, it's from the 70s. Yes, it's vintage. Yes, it's pretty cool looking, for, let's be honest. Uh, but at least do, you know, if this, RP, and this thing was missing pieces, broken pieces, everything, and I articulated that very well through the listing. Yeah, like I said, you need to articulate these things. Um, it only lasted a couple of days, four days. Um, so it's hopefully going off to a collector. This box wasn't fantastic. What I found that worked to my favor is that I actually priced it appropriately because if this thing was pristine, I mean, the sense all the pieces were there and none of the pieces were broken like mine were. Um, and that box is probably on the good side of the boxes that are actually currently out there. Uh, would have gone about $80, $80 $90 um, for parts only, probably about $25, which I think I listed it at 
yeah, 25. I think I must have sent an offer out for 22.49. <clears throat> so I did get a little bit of money back on it. It was a very quick turnaround. Um, and it was a pretty cool display piece, to tell you the truth. Oh, that's what I was probably going to keep it for. Just, um, eventually, one day, um, I will put some shells up here. And now I've been telling everyone for a very long time, uh, just probably trying to need to work out <laughs> what I could put behind me. But something like this would have been on that wall. So I've got my little, my little ghastly and uh, my little dumpster fire, my little octopus collection down there at the moment. But um, like I said, I'll jump back in that screen. Uh, so basically, like I said, I paid five dollars from Vinnie's. and wasn't too particularly happy that they had a thing on it saying sold as is. If you're going to do that, just basically tell them what's wrong with it. You know, broken pieces, missing pieces, all that perspective. I still would have been happy to pay the five dollars. So my return was fifteen dollars after the said and done. So they paid postage. They paid uh, the cost of goods was five dollars. So so the total cost was seventeen fifty six. Uh, 1256 with postage and the fees that eBay charged me, bringing it to just shy of 50 cent profit margin um, after said and done. And that was pretty much the to wrap it up for the, the, the basically the items that I picked up this week. So if you do like this kind of format video, please like, comment, and share. Uh, put a comment in the, the, the comment box below if you like this kind of content. I do enjoy doing what's sold videos. Uh, I want to give people an indication of what to look for, not necessarily what to buy or bolos from that perspective, but what I'm selling, uh, what's selling well for me. Like I said, I normally curate those eight items out of that 40 or 50, whatever I sell per a week, um, just to give you an idea of things that might necessarily be on your radar or things that you can potentially look at. Um, I very seldom sell clothes because <laughs> I hate them. Um, but I do have a, a lot of clothes in the garage where I have said before, and I'm probably looking at probably wholesaling them at one stage. But like I said, keep an eye on it. If you are happy, put down, I'd love to see more of this content and I probably will roll the, the uh, Sunday videos into this kind of thing. Uh, we'll see how it all rolls out and goes from that perspective. But like I said, if you keep, oh, you know, what we'll do now is we'll probably sign off. However, I want to run a little video that I sh shot down at Naruma, which is the, um, the south coast of New South Wales in Australia. Um, so the discounted octopus sent me a message through on my phone um, to basically let me know that he was into some negotiations with a local sea life down there to try and uh, find a, a place to <laughs> commence his world domination aspirations. So what we'll do, we'll sign off now and I'll catch you next week and we'll watch the video straight after this. Bye.
dreams of a throne and a heart that's keen The octopus went to Donald, it's true He's on the rise and he's coming for you